Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackie Goran. I'm uh, from the IVN team, uh, and I will be leading this panel this uh, afternoon. Uh, I appreciate everyone for staying for this panel, uh, and I hope that by the end of the panel, everyone will understand why uh, affordable housing in Israel is a social business. Uh, because uh, I think you heard a lot about social businesses and different ways to tackle uh, social issues uh, in the last two sessions that we had, but we never heard the word affordable housing there. So I guess you are wondering why are, are we uh, doing this panel uh, focusing on affordable housing. Uh, so we in IVN were also puzzling about a year ago uh, when Elisheva is sitting here and I will introduce her later. Uh, came to us with an idea, uh, uh, a very innovative idea about affordable housing in Israel. We asked ourselves whether affordable housing is at all within our scope uh, of social businesses, because this is what we do. So we started learning, as we always do, and we tried to look and see how affordable housing is uh, defined uh, in uh, different uh, uh, sources that we looked for. I have it in Hebrew. I was planning on doing this in Hebrew, but in the last minute I'm, I'm doing it in English for Shalin's sake. So it's written in Hebrew. I try to translate. Please apologize. My apology if I have a, a word that I'm missing. Uh, so of course affordable housing uh, to begin with is uh, houses that are affordable <coughs> for people with average income. This is a very uh, tautologic uh, uh, um, definition, definition of what it is. And when we looked further, further uh, we, we saw a definition of uh, housing that are either for sale or for rent, when in the prices uh, we take into account social needs and the economic situation of the buyer or the person who rents the house. So this, we see inside this definition, uh, words that are relating to social needs and economic situation, uh, which is a little bit closer to a social business. Uh, the third uh, thing that we learn is that although we usually use affordable housing uh, when we think about uh, uh, disadvantaged populations or weak populations, uh, we can see that in the world, we use the term affordable housing uh, also for people who rent houses and buy apartments that, uh, that are from different social uh, uh, levels, not just for uh, needy populations. Uh, and last but not least, in the US and Canada, we saw a definition that says that affordable housing is housing that people are investing, whether in uh, renting or uh, paying the mortgage, not more than 30% of their uh, uh, gross income. So these are different definitions of affordable housing. I think my mic. Okay. No, now it's back on. Okay. Uh, another thing that we learned that really surprised us a little bit is that uh, governments uh, in many countries, uh, either socialist countries or capitalist countries, are involved in affordable housing uh, and usually uh, and, 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 uh, and they, are, they are getting involved in affordable housing in several uh, occasions. Uh, we can see it when there is uh, areas, there is uh, more demand than the supply of housing. So we just see the government doing all sorts of things in order uh, to enlarge the amount of uh, housing. Uh, to solve this gap, this social gap. We can see the government involved in areas in which the uh, uh, economic Tamil uh, mixture uh, is uh, such that you can see either a very poor population living there or a very rich population living there and the government wants to uh, create a more balanced mixture or for example uh, uh, in areas in which rich populations are getting into poorer areas and the poor uh, people that used to live there cannot afford buying their houses anymore and they're moving out. So these are also occasions that we saw that governments are getting involved. Uh, and the most obvious is of course uh, taking care of uh, people that need, uh, people that are 
disadvantaged, from coming from disadvantaged populations and they have special needs. So we can see that even in a very capitalist countries like the United States, uh, which usually we assume that the markets are balancing the demand and supply, governments are involved in creating affordable housing in different ways for their population. So this is another thing that we've learned when we thought whether we want or not to invest in affordable housing projects in Jerusalem. Uh, we learned, of course, about the situation in Israel, and we saw that there is uh, more demand and supply, actually, between 2002 and 2011. Uh, the demand grows by 390,000 households, while the supply grew only by 330,000 households. Uh, and also the price accordingly raised, and if in 2005 uh, people, uh, uh, if they had to buy an apartment in a million shekels, had spent 100 salaries on that, now they need to spend 133 salaries on that, uh, which is a 30% increase. Um, so we can see a gap, a social gap here. Uh, when we looked at the solutions, we saw really a variety of solutions, and I'm not going to get into each and one of them. But when we look about financing, uh, we saw different players that are uh, participating in affordable housing, government, philanthropic money, and we saw something interesting, interesting, not in Israel, but other places in the world, which is a social investor. And Glenn will talk about it later, and maybe Shirley also. Uh, when we look at a population, as I said before, we saw affordable housing not just for disadvantaged population, but also for uh, young population and middle class. Uh, who are the entrepreneurs? We saw government as entrepreneurs in doing that, uh, uh, municipalities, social organizations doing that, and a mixture of social and business uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We saw many, many tools, uh, and I think that the Ariel Yotzel will uh, speak uh, about uh, the different tools. And a lot of solutions uh, from uh, reducing the price, limiting the rent uh, price, uh, building specifically for renting or building for uh, uh, a mixture of uh, renting and, and <coughs> So after we learned all of that, and of course we had on board some specialist board both from uh, the social world and of course uh, from the business world, like uh, Aviv One that will talk about his experience as a um, real estate entrepreneur and mentor in IVN. We came to the conclusion, after reading back our definition of social business, which is a business that uh, was incorporated in order to solve or promote a social challenge by using business tools, uh, that has a double bottom line, financial and social, and that its primary goal is social and not financial, we came to the conclusion that uh, affordable housing is indeed a social business, and this is why we decided uh, to get involved in the Ruach Hadasha project that we will explain later. Um, so, in this panel now, uh, I don't know if you are convinced and you share our conclusion, but uh, we wanted to bring all the uh, different stakeholders, I think, in such a project, some of which are involved in the project, some of which are not in the market, uh, and hear their views. Uh, and ideas and thoughts after a year uh, being involved in this issue from different perspectives. Uh, so I will first introduce each one of you and uh, then I will ask a question, a specific question for each one of you. Uh, so I will pass to the ladies. Uh, Ms. Shalene Saido from the Life Foundation. Uh, can you say just words about your involvement in affordable housing in Israel? Sure, two, two words. I'm done. <laughs> We're involved. Uh, Charlene Seidel from the Leech Tag Foundation Executive Director. We're a foundation based in San Diego, a private independent foundation. We focus our philanthropy in San Diego and on Jerusalem. We look at Jerusalem as a microcosm of social and economic gaps in Israel and as a foundation that is pursuing a modified spend down with a limited life as an incredible demonstration ground as a lab 
to develop new solutions to problems that are facing the entire country or that may face the entire country one day. We see Jerusalem's diversity and complexity and intensity and everything that makes Jerusalem so problematic as real drivers of creativity, innovative thinking, and um, um, uh, leverage to, to leverage change. Um, our focus in Jerusalem is threefold. Number one, we work to keep young people in the city through funding organizations like Ruch Kadasha, which sponsors young communities, youth service, social activism, social entrepreneurship, arts and culture, and now affordable housing, which is the number one reason with jobs why young people cannot stay in Jerusalem. The second area that we fund in Jerusalem is Haredi workforce development. And the third area is workforce development and economic advancement in East Jerusalem for the uh, Palestinian population there. So that's the that long tour. Thank you. Uh, Elisa Romadia. I'm running Boha Nishar, a new spirit organization. We're uh, basically trying to uh, save the city of Jerusalem with building the young professionals and young activists community uh, through different projects. And we've come to the understanding that eventually, uh, after nine years of working in Jerusalem with a lot of other organizations and the government and municipality, there are much more young people today that want to settle in Jerusalem, but they can't afford. And this is why we've come to the conclusion that we need to develop affordable housing. This is why we're here. והמטרת המכון זה מכון מחקר בעצם לשגר נוצרים במדיניות ותהליכים פיננסיים לפיתוח כלכלי בכל רחבי העולם וכל הבעיות שיש להם בחברתי סביבתי וכדומה. הפיתוח שלנו פה בארץ, כפי שסיורנו הזכיר, אז עם עמיתינו שבעצם יורדים בעבודה במערכת במשרדי ממשלה, באוצר, במשרד רוה"מ סביבה, משרד הרווחה גם, משרד הבריאות וכדומה, על דברים שיכולים להשקעות ומשקעות יותר בכל הבעיות של הפערים שאנחנו מתעסקים בהם. שלום, צהריים טובים, שמי אריאל יוצר, אני מרכז תחום הבינוי והשיכון באגף תקציבים במשרד האוצר, בין היתר אני מתעסק גם בתקציב ותקציבי התרבות והספורט, משרד הדתות, נגב גליל, והחטיבה להתיישבות, התיק הכבד ביותר שלי, אין זה הרבה תיקים, התיק הכבד ביותר הוא כמובן תיק הנדל"ן או הבינוי והשיכון. התפקיד בגדול מתחלק לשני ערוצים מרכזיים, הראשון זה ניהול תקציבי שוטף של המשרדים הרלוונטיים, והשני זה קידום שינויים מבניים במשרדים השונים, זה נהדר על אחד מהם. שלום, אחרי הצהריים טובים לכולם, קוראים אביב. אני הצטרפתי לפני שנה ל... It's interesting, all the ones with the accent and this is speaking English, and all the ones without accent. Anyway, I joined IVN a year ago, and I'm serving as a mentor on this project. My background is sort of double-sided. I started my career in management consulting, then I was for many years in the high-tech industry, uh, mainly overseas in the US and in Europe, and uh, um, then uh, a little bit in Israel after I came back with my family to Israel. Um, and about six years ago, I um, ventured into the world of uh, real estate, a major turn for an ex-high-tech guy. Um, so if, uh, if anybody of you wants some excitement in their life, switch from a high-tech to a real estate, make sure you do it two years before the worst financial crisis in the world <laughs> since the Great Depression. That will uh, give you some uh, white hairs. <coughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I joined this uh, project and it's a very exciting one. It's the one that uh, really tries to uh, uh, provide innovation in an area that uh, um, usually does not have a lot of innovation. Uh, real estate is a very traditional uh, discipline and uh, it's very different from high-tech in that uh, regard. And we're trying to uh, find a way to uh, make progress in it, which is uh, not easy, but very exciting. So, thanks. 
Uh, so just uh, briefly, I guess we will go back. We can go back. Um, some of the basic ideas, I was just thinking about it, it's been about a little over a year since Jackie invited me to her tents down in Nordas Street. Um, and this whole discussion, and we're giving lectures around talking about how to, uh, between Rothschild and Nordau and become enough on how to find affordable housing. And then every, all hell kind of broke loose, and there was a whole big discussion during Trachtenberg, and the folks from Merkab who were here, and everybody was sort of involved in that discussion. And then Trachtenberg comes out with the, the, that section and, and the, uh, the planning law uh, uh, of Badaling that comes out. And the whole question is we're all only talking about 70,000 units of housing, and how can we make them affordable? It's actually more than that, you know, uh, what the problem is about affordability, given the definition that, uh, that Jackie had presented earlier. So, you know, just kind of go down to basics. Uh, I'm originally an academic, so he's slightly academic here. This is the basic structure of how development happens. Social enterprises are clearly a very key driver in many of uh, uh, the experiences we had in Los Angeles. Genesis Redevelopment Corporation, the Bay Area's fund in San Francisco or Boston Community Capital or a thousand other cities around the, uh, uh, the United States as well as in England and, other, and in France as well that dealt with this was to intervene in this basic development process. And many of the developers were indeed social enterprises, churches, social organizations. Uh, the city of Los Angeles, uh, under Mayor Reardon, we formed a, uh, a nonprofit corporation. Uh, that basically would be outside of government in order to do this type of development. The very creative work that Ellie Sheva, with the support of uh, Charlene and others, has been able to do, and, and we tried to help with that, is to set up a platform for that. But what, at every stage of this development process, to break it down, you've got these, you've got these very uh, basic problems in terms of site control with the Minhal, the question of trying to free up land for that purpose, because let's face it, the Israeli Land Authority delivers about $5 billion worth of revenue into the Treasury every year. And I don't think that Ruben and, and, and his group wants to give up on that money. So the question is, how do you structure that type of release of land in terms of controlling the land costs in order to do that? Living in a country that has no transfer of development rights from the Mughal to individuals or to communities or to cities uh, in order to do that. So it's a very difficult and cumbersome process to get that. All of these areas and problems that you see here of, of, of delays, the famous bureaucracy, but how that sort of works with the, the, the Badalim law tried to change a little bit in terms of, of the planning process, but a lot of things that deal with uncompetitiveness and part of that. What's the scenario right now? If we take, uh, if, if we take Jackie's definition, and I'm, I just want to make sure I stick to the time. Um, this is basically the only way place that the market's really working is in the luxury market. Uh, either in Tel Aviv, especially in the center of the country in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. And you can see what's happening in terms of apartments, how they basically can provide adequate, adequate paybacks, um, uh, the way that the capital structure, remember capital structure, that's all we're trying to do, is align a capital structure in the, the, the brilliant presentations we heard from Eric and, and, and Sir Ronald, the way of, of establishing a capital structure that can be responsive to a strategy that will bridge these gaps. <laughs> And so uh, this one is currently not doing it uh, because the return on, it, on payback is quite good and marketable in terms of the luxury housing market. The debt is supported by the net operating company uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the project. However, you can see that it's basically not affordable in all the categories that you would want to reach in terms of affordability for the great majority. Of, I mean, the whole country needs affordable housing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, not just the top end of it, and that's why you have lots of empty apartments in, in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv that are owned by people, because that's the only profitable market. So there are no units that are basically affordable there. So what is affordable housing? I think Jackie covered that. So I'll just read, this is all going to be available to you to you know, send you this little presentation. So what's the affordable scenario today? Right now it just falls off of a cliff. You can't provide any operating projections of income that are satisfactory. Um, there's no sources of senior and guaranteed debts that are, are available. Uh, the operating, operating losses can't attract any equity. The net operating income is insufficient to support debt, cash flows, and losses need to bleed the reserves really quickly. So what, what do we have? What are the tools that we have or that we don't have in order to address this? We don't have what you have in other countries, and we have no tax credits for secondary or for civilian <coughs> equity. Uh, in the second Clinton administration, it was really an honor to work on the new markets tax credit that was able to explode the amount of capital that came into the market 
um, uh, for urban redevelopment and for affordable housing. Um, we have the whole issue of 90% of the, of the ownership being concentrated, in spite of reforms and everything, but again, no transfer of development rights for existing houses in Katamontet and Jerusalem that are uh, owned by the residents, but they have no, they have no building rights uh, associated with it. Um, uh, uh, the earthquake law in Tamashoshim, the Shmona, that gives some opportunity to that, but it's not been exploited in affordable housing areas. You could rapidly increase, increase densities in places like Yafo and in South Tel Aviv, in Kiryat Yobel, and a number of other places in Jerusalem and Haifa too. Um, we don't have any uh, targeted multifamily lending or guarantee revolving loan programs. We don't have any targeted to mix the incomes on the unit prices and the like. And so, and we don't have any sort of shared equity mortgages or things like that, like in the UK, that were very effective in trying to share the risk uh, and bring people <coughs> into the ownership or even into the rental market. So, right now, the, how do we get the guarantee amount to be reduced? Um, and get it, get it to this sort of situation where the debt could be supported by the net operating income and get returns to senior equity. And, pardon me for, but, and then we can make things affordable. So this is a way basically that we could do that and become affordable at a, at a larger level for moderate income. So what's needed in this, with this I'll basically close, there's a lot of backup on this and you can go through the numbers and that's basically what Ellie Sheva was able to do and present and, the, uh, and she'll go into some detail of what uh, she is launching, uh, she and, and her colleagues are launching, but without any tax or financial market change, uh, you get subordinated low-cost debt that could go into a social enterprise, subordinated equity, um, and, and some guarantees, in this case, the idea of trying to do which was the uh, Leibniz Foundation's idea, was to try to build up some form of a, a, uh, a um, private place in the memorandum that would attract investment into the affordable housing space, Jerusalem being a model that's spreading out into more cities that would allow people, that would allow the affordability to be created. But with tax and financial market changes, and clearly you have to walk with two feet uh, in terms of trying to create an affordable housing market in this country, the changes that have to be done in order to provide longer term low cost tax exempt capital market bonds, which don't exist in this country, um, uh, so, in a sense, a social impact bond or a way of funding uh, uh, some form of, of enterprise investment by nonprofits that would go into this market would be, would be credible. You have to have tax credits, which are, are not currently aggregated or transferable to syndicate to raise private equity that would go into there. And, um, and some limited guarantees that could be provided as well, which the government in partnership with philanthropies could guide. So that's basically what's needed. Um, we can improvise, because Israel's very good at improvisation, as, as Ronald had mentioned, um, and we can improvise right now, but we also have to walk the path of the policy and programmatic changes uh, to get things into place that will make, uh, that we can convince the people, and I got the taxi thing, that we will not lose money, uh, or forego the money that could be made on luxury housing by creating more affordability and access uh, to shelter at other income levels. Okay, so now when we understand the gaps and we see that many of the gaps are uh, in the yard of the government, I think it will be appropriate time for the young uh, representative of our government to come and say what they have been doing in the last year. פחות ההתעסקות הייתה בתמהיל ההצעה, זאת אומרת, 
איך זה סוג של דירות אנחנו מוציאים החוצה, אלא המדיניות הייתה להתמקד במספר יחידות הדיור שיוצאות בשוק ופחות להתעסק בתמהיל ההיצע, וזה שאנחנו, אני חושב שלפחות או יותר לפני שנתיים, הבנו שההתעסקות צריכה להיות לא רק בהיקף הקרקעות המשווק לשוק, אלא גם מה בונים עליהן. אז רק כדי למקד אותנו במגרש שעליו אנחנו נמצאים, אז לפי הסקר של מפקד האוכלוסין האחרון, 26.6% ממשקי הבית מתגוררים היום בשכירות, 66% הם דיירים בעלים, קרי גרים בדירה בדירה בבעלותם, ועוד 8% הסדרים אחרים, הסדרים אחרים בעיקר אנחנו מדברים על דיור ציבורי, על הוסטלים והסדרים כאלה. קרי, אנחנו מדברים על שוק של חצי מיליון משקי בית שגר היום בשכירות, ועוד מעט נדבר על השוק ועל המאפיינים על זה, על שוק השכירות הקיים היום בישראל. עוד תזה שנשברה לנו אחרי ששנים האמנו בה ושבדקנו מאוד התפלאנו לראות את הנתונים, זה ששיעור הדירות שירות, שיעור הדיירים או הסוחרים, או להפך, שיעור הדיירים הבעלים בישראל, הוא לא אה, אה, שיעור גבוה יותר מהממוצע העולמי, אנחנו רואים שאנחנו נמצאים בשיעור דיירים בעלים נמוך יותר מגוש האירו ונמוך יותר מהאירופה האירופאי, אומנם לא באחוזים מאוד גבוהים, אבל עדיין בשיעור אה, אה, דיירים בעלים נמוך יותר, ואחרי שנים שהאמינו שהתפיסה או הרצון או הטעמים הישראלים לגור בדירה בבעלותך, עם השנים בגלל פעם אחת עליית מחירי דיור, פעם שנייה אפיקי השקעה חדשים, שיעור הדיירים שגרים בדירות להשכרה והולכים לאפיקי השקעה אחרים הלך וגדל ואנחנו נמצאים היום פחות או יותר בשיעורים דומים למה שקורה בעולם. מסקנה מיידית הייתה, כנותן לפחות, הוא ששוק הסיעוד הוא שוק מספיק גדול כדי לטפל בו ולגוון אותו ולראות שהוא נותן כלים מספיק טובים ומגוונים לאזרחים שבאמת הולכים ובוחרים במסלול המגורים הזה. כשהתחלנו לבדוק את שוק השכירות בישראל, הגענו מיד למסקנה הברורה ביותר שהייתה, כלומר פעם אחת היא מאפיינת את השוק באופן גורף, ופעם שנייה היא משפיעה על התנהגות השוק כולו, זה ששוק השכירות היום נשלט באופן כמעט מוחלט על ידי משקיעים פרטיים. זאת אומרת, רוב מי ש... הרוב המוחלט של המשכירים הם אנשים פרטיים שבאו וראו בקנייה דירה שנייה אפיק השקעה, ואותו הם משכירים לאנשים שהם למעשה אינם בעלי דירה. המבנה הזה של השוק משפיע על התנהגות השוק בכמה פרמטרים מיידיים. אחד, אנחנו מדברים על חוזים קצרי טווח. אופי ההשקעה של משקיעים פרטיים הוא שהם מעדיפים לעשות חוזה שמתחדש כל שנה, וזה כמובן גורם פעם אחת לחוסר ודאות למחיר הסבירות לטווח ארוך, פעם שנייה חוסר ודאות לאיפה אני כסוחר יגור בשנה הבאה, זה בטח ובטח בעייתי יותר כשאני כסוחר גם מהווה משק בית עם ילדים, שלהם אני צריך לחשוב איפה הם הולכים לגנים בשנה הבאה, לבית ספר בשנה הבאה, וכל המעבר של דירה משנה לשנה הופך להיות שיקול משמעותי אצל ישראלים שמתלבטים האם לרכוש דירה או לדבור בסביבות. דבר נוסף שקורה בגלל המשתנים שדיברתי עליהם, בגלל הפרמטרים שדיברתי עליהם קודם, זה ש... וזה אני מדבר פעם אחת מה... גאון הבסיסי, ופעם שנייה על פרי סקר ביקושים שביצענו. לא מעט אנשים הולכים ובוחרים באופציה של רכישת דירה, דווקא בגלל שהמסלול של שכירות ארוכת טווח, קרי לחתום על חוזה ארוך טווח במחיר ידוע מראש, לא קיים עבורם, ועושים את שיקול קניית הדירה, כשמבחינה כלכלית השיקול הוא לא בהכרח שיקול נכון. למה אני מתכוון? אני אסביר את זה קצת יותר בפשטות. באופן סביר, כשאתה מבצע השקעה, השאלה היא כמה כסף אתה יודע להביא כהון עצמי. לא מעט משקי בית, בגלל ההשפעות החיצוניות של מעבר דירה משנה לשנה, הולכים ורוכשים דירה גם כשהם לא הצליחו לגייס מספיק הון עצמי, בעזרת כל מיני מכשירים פיננסיים, 
אה, EMI למיניהם, או אה, אה, סוגים אחרים של גיוס הון, ואנחנו אה, רואים שהולכים ומבצעים השקעה כלכלית לא בהכרח נכונה, ואם היה לנו פתרון נוח יותר ויציב יותר של מגורים אה, בהשכרה עד שהיו יודעים לגייס מספיק הון עצמי, אני מניח שהטעמים שלהם היו משתנים. הבעיה היא שעד היום לא היה כלי אה, אה, כזה או מכשיר כזה שנקרא זכויות ארוכת טווח, וכל מי שהעדיף אה, אה, לא להתמודד עם המעבר הזה של אה, משנה לשנה וחוסר הוודאות הזאת, לפעמים נדחף לקניית דירה גם כשבאופן, אה, 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 או מבחינה כלכלית, זה לא היה בהכרח בצד הנכון. מה החסמים העיקריים בשוק הסטרות בישראל? בגלל שציינתי קודם ששוק הסטרות בישראל נשלט באופן גורף על ידי משקיעים פרטיים, רצינו לראות מי הם הגופים שאותם אנחנו יכולים להכניס פנימה כדי שיאפשרו פעם אחת שכירות במחיר סביר, פעם שנייה לטווח ארוך, פעם שלישית שמלאי השכירות יישאר מלאי בר קיימא לטווח ארוך ולמעשה יאפשר מוצר חדש שנקרא יחידות דיור להשכרה בלבד ולא יחידות דיור שהן יחידות דיור שהן לבעלות ואותו משקיע משכיר אותן משנה לשנה. אז המשחק הראשון, באופן עקרוני קודם כל מפילים את השוק של שלושה פרמטרים, אחד זה המשקיעים הפרטיים שנמצאים שם היום, שתיים זה יזמים קבלניים שבונים היום דירות ומוכרים אותן ושלוש, זה גופים מוסדיים, אותם גופים שמנהלים את כספי הפנסיה של כולנו למעשה ואת תקופות הגבר. בסוף, אנחנו בדקנו שני דברים. פעם אחת, את שיעור התשואה שאותם פרויקטים יודעים להעניק, ופעם שנייה, את אופי הפעולה או את יכולות הפעולה של אותם גורמים שונים כדי להכניס אותם עם הלקוח השיפור. את השוק של המשקיעים הפרטיים, מהר מאוד יחסית פסלנו מהסביבה המאוד פשוטה שנמצאים שם היום ואנחנו רואים שהמצב הוא לא אה, המצב אליו אנחנו שואפים, לא מבחינת טווחי הזמן ולא מבחינת אה, הוודאות אה, של אה, חוזה הסכימות. ולכן הם יצאו מהמגרש, נשארנו למעשה עם החברות, חברות הבנייה, הקבלנים, היזמים ועם הגופים המוסדיים. ופה למעשה אה, המשחק או המבחן הראשון שבו היינו צריכים אה, להתעסק כדי למשוך אותם גופים פנימה לשוק הזה היה מבחן אה, התשואה. בואו נראה רגע איזה תשואה מניבה היום, אה, אה, מניב היום שוק השכירות כדי להבין שזה היה החסם המרכזי הראשון שבו נתקלנו. אנחנו מדברים על משנת 2001 על גרף אה, הולך ויורד שבשיאו הגיע ל-4.78 אחוז ונמצא היום בערך על כ-3 אחוז, 3.5 אחוזים. צריך להבין שסביבת תשואה כזאת היא סביבת תשואה של המשקיעים עסקיים, קרי קונצרנים, אין מה לחפש שם. אם אלה התשואות שאותן אנחנו יודעים לייצר, או אותו השוק יודע לייצר, צריך להבין שמשקיעים קונצרנים לא ייכנסו לשם. לכן הדבר הראשון שרצינו להתמודד איתו הוא בעיקרון בעיית התשואה. צריך להבין מבחינת המדיניות והתזה שלנו, התפיסה באוצר היא שהתערבות ממשלתית צריכה להיות, לא צריכה להיות לא התערבות גסה ולא התערבות מלאכותית, הממשלה, בטח לא את השוק הזה, לא צריכה לנהל. מה היא כן צריכה לעשות? היא צריכה ליצור תנאים ברגולציה מתאימה כדי לשוק, לתת לשוק להתנהל לבד, אחרי שהיא הבהירה מסגרת כללים או כללי אה, אה, התנהלות. מה שנקרא במקרו, ונותנת לשוק לפעול לבד. כל התערבות מלאכותית וגסה בסוף תגרום לעיוות בהקצאה, והרבה מאוד פעמים גם להגעת משאבים ציבוריים, לא למקום שאליו כיוונו שהם יגיעו, והתפיסה היא שהשוק יודע לעשות את זה טוב יותר מאיתנו, כל עוד יצרנו את התנאים המתאימים. ולכן, כמו שאמרתי, חיפשנו, הדבר הראשון שחיפשנו להתעסק איתו זה למעשה התשואה. בסוף, איפה הממשלה יודעת להשפיע על התשואה של אותם פרויקטים? בשני רכיבים, פעם אחת בערך הקרקע, פעם שנייה במסלול. לכן הצעד הראשון שעשינו, כבר כמעט לפני שנה, העברנו החלטת מועצה במועצת מקרקעי ישראל שבאה ואמרה שהמינהל ישווק חטיבות קרקע גדולות, מעל 100 יחידות דיור, שבו הוא מוסיף למסמכי המכרז למעשה שני תנאים עיקריים. 
התנאי הראשון מדבר על זה שהקרקע מיועדת להשכרה בלבד ל-20 שנה. אי אפשר לעשות בקרקע הזאת משום דבר אחר, פרט להשכיר את הדירות. בעל הקרקע לא יכול להעביר את הבעלות בקרקע למי שמתגורר. פעם, פעם שנייה, באנו ואמרנו, במכרזי המינהל, אני לא יודע כמה אנחנו מכירים את זה, אבל יש מנגנון שנקרא מחיר מינימום. זאת אומרת, מי שמציע מחיר נמוך מאותו מחיר נקוב כמחיר מינימום, למעשה אפילו לא פותחים את המעטפה שלו. את המנגנון הזה משכנו החוצה, והוצאנו קרקעות החוצה, או התכוונו להוציא קרקעות החוצה, שפעם אחת מוגדרות כקרקע לסבירות בלבד. עצם זה שהגדרתי את הקרקע כקרקע לסבירות בלבד ל-20 שנה, למעשה, ואני אומר במרכאות, פגעתי בערך שלה, כי יש על הקרקע הזאת איזושהי מגבלה, וכדי לאפשר למחיר הקרקע לרדת, גם הורדתי את אותו מנגנון של מחיר מינימום, שלא מונע ממחירת קרקעות לרדת. והקשבתי לקרקעות, למחירי הקרקע לרדת. כדי לסבר את המשמעות של המהלך הזה, המנגנון המכרזי שבנינו מבחינתי אומר לפחות שגם אם מישהו יציע על אותה קרקע בתנאים שהכתבתי שקל והוא יהיה הכי גבוה, הוא זה שזוכה. זה הדבר והמהלך הראשון והמרכזי שעשינו. עוד מעט אני מדבר על המכרז הראשון שיצא, אבל תבינו שמדובר פה על הטבה ממשלתית, מנכסי הציבור מאוד גדולה. מדברים על קרקעות שבמקומות מסוימים ערך קרקע ליחידת דיור מגיע גם ל-400 ו-500 אלף שקל ליחידה ועל כל זה באופן עקרוני אנחנו מוכנים לוותר כל עוד אנחנו יודעים שלשוק יוצא מוצר שנקרא מוצר לסבירות ארוכת טווח. הדבר השני שאיתו רצינו להתמודד זה אותה אפליית מס שקיימת בין משקיעים פרטיים למשקיעים קונצרניים. משקיע פרטי שמשקיע היום בשכירות למעשה פטור מתשלום על מס על ההכנסה שלו משכירות עד לגובה של 4,900 שקל לחודש. מנתונים שאנחנו בדקנו, 70% מהמשכירים למעשה לא משלמים מס. <coughs> כמובן שכשאתה משווה את התנאים או את מדיניות המס שחלה על סוחרים, על משכירים פרטיים, לעומת מדיניות המס שחלה על משכירים קונצרנים, אתה רואה כאן אפליה ברורה. כמו שלמשל מזכירים קוצרנים, צריכים לשלם מס חברות על, מס חברות על ההכנסות שלהם מזכירות ולכן הממשלה הציעה חוק שעבר בשלוש קריאות ופוטר גופים מוסדיים, קופות גמל וקרנות פנסיה מהכנסה על, ממסוי למעשה על הכנסה מסחר דירה אותו חוק שעשינו עומד במקביל לחוק עידוד השקעות הון שכבר חוקק בשנת 2007 ומאפשר לקבלנים הטבות מס אחרות כדי לעודד אותם להשקיע בהשכרה. הדבר השלישי כמובן, ועליו כבר דיברתי, זה התחרות הלא הוגנת בין בנייה למכירה לבין בנייה להשכרה. ברור שקרקע שהיא מיועדת לבנייה, של לבנות עליה דירות ואחרי זה למכור אותה לדייר שוויה גדול יותר, וכדי לאפשר תחרות הוגנת, הגדרנו, כמו שאמרתי קודם, את הקרקע לקרקע להשכרה ולא לקרקע למחקר. למעשה, איפה הממשלה מרוויחה והציבור מרוויח מההתערבות בשוק השכירות? קודם כל, אנחנו מקטינים את התנודתיות בשוק הדיור על ידי זה שאנחנו מאפשרים מוצר חדש, שכירות ארוכת טווח ולא רק דיור בבעלות. מתן נציבות לסוחר, דיברנו על שוק לטווח ארוך. העלאת סטנדרט התחזוקה בניהול דירות להשכרה כמקובל בעולם, אנחנו במסמכי המכרז מגדירים כיצד הדירות צריכות להיות מנוהלות, מה צריך להיות סטנדרט הבנייה ועוד. והדבר האחרון זה כלי למוביליות חברתית, וזה צריך, ל... זה עניין שחשוב להבין. <coughs> אוכלוסיות חלשות יותר לא יודעות לרכוש דירה באזורי ביקוש, בגלל שלתוך של... העניין הזה צריך לגייס לו מעצמי מאוד גדול. כן יודעות ל... 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 להתגורר באזורי ביקוש כשהן גרות בשכירות. ולכן לאפשר שוק שכירות יציב לטווח ארוך מאפשר גם מוביליות חברתית וגם את העניין הזה ראינו נגד... אני מדייק את הסוף האחרון ומסייר. המשולש הזה למעשה בסוף מציג את כל המודל, את שלושת צלעות המודל ממש בקצרה. פעם אחת מכרזים יהודיים לשכירות ארוכת טווח, פעם
פעם שנייה הטבות, אה, אה, הטבות מיסוי, ופעם של, שלישית רגולציה מאפשרת קרי תקיפת המכרזים האלה באזורי הביקוש. דבר משפט אחרון, נמצא היום מכרז, נמצא היום מכרז באוויר ברעננה 240 יחידות דיור, שמיועד בדיוק לאותו מודל שהצגתי, השכרה ארוכת סבך. אנחנו מקווים שאותם גופים שאליהם קיבלנו גם באמת יזכו במכרז הזה. אם אכן המכרז הזה יצליח ויבואו אחריו עוד מכרזים אחרים, אז זה ממש בשורה גדולה לשוק ושינוי מדיניות ותפיסה גדול ממדיניות שהונהגה כאן שנים פה. זהו, תודה. תודה רבה, זה היה מאוד מעודד, אני חושבת שזה היה מאוד מעודד. אבל זה סוף פרופלם שבהם המקומות שהמקומות שלנו נמצאים על ידי המקומות, ואז המקומות שלנו יכולים להיות בטוחים. לא בטוחים בטוחים, אבל פרומות, פרומות. אבל אני חושבת שאני חושבת שאני חושבת שאני חושבת שאני חושבת שאני חושבת because there are places where there is no governmental land that can be used in order to solve these problems that uh, we all talk about. Uh, and what, what are we doing there? So I would like to hear from you, uh, your involvement, to hear a little bit about your project. And you can go to the English and Hebrew, it's up to you. I'll do it in English to be honest. Um, so first of all, just uh, two words about Ruach HaDashah, about, about the spirit and how we got into that. As I, as I said before, we've been dealing with how to keep young, young people in Jerusalem, spe specifically the graduates of the university and the colleges in Jerusalem. And there's a lot of problems or challenges in Jerusalem, and one of them Uh, one of the main things that we've come to understand in recent years that we have a huge shortage in, in apartments for young people. And there is a huge problem of, of lack of affordable housing all over Israel. The problem in Jerusalem that we have, we're facing problems with the, with the, um, from, from two sides. One is that The, housing price, the, the prices of the housing are really high as much as we have in Tel Aviv. But on the other hand, unfortunately, Jerusalem is still not as attractive as the center of Israel. And this is why we, we're facing these two problems, really uh, it's a, a major obstacle for, for young people to decide to settle in Jerusalem. And this is why uh, we decided to uh, have this initiative Eventually, as everyone else, I believe this is something that the, the, the government should lead and, and it's actually do it. But I think that um, New Spirit, and, uh, as other organizations in Israel are doing, can, can do this connection between bringing the people, the communities, and uh, uh, promoting very innovative kind of solutions. Now, together with IVN and with Lincoln Institution and, and of course, by the leadership of, of Lichtberg Foundation, uh, we've come to understand that eventually, as I said, the prices in Jerusalem are really high, and this is why we think that uh, long-term rent is one of the major solutions that we can promote in Jerusalem. I was, uh, um, I'm, I'm going a lot to the States because I need to do fundraising for my organization. And every time in the past two years, I've, I've uh, met with a few NGOs that are uh, doing this kind of long-term rent, build, rent building that they call in the States community building, which I think it's an, a beautiful expression for, for exactly what it is. I'm really inspired by the, by the U.S. Uh, mentality that, that sees apartment not just as a functional thing like a car, They really see it as a major part of your uh, uh, high quality life and as a part of a community. And not just, I don't know mo most of the people that live in my building and I think this is a, uh, a major part that could have, um, bring my life to, in Jerusalem to be better. So uh, there's a lot of NGOs that have been doing it in the States from, from the 80s and I'm, I was really inspired by that and 
this is exactly what we're uh, trying to build. I must say, uh, according to what Jackie said, that one of the things that we do want to do is work with we work with the government and, and one, one of the things that we want to do is to be um, some kind of a social entrepreneurs that, that uh, 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 take these standards of the, of the long-term rent because we do afraid. I think there's a, um, a huge uh, progress in the long-term rent issues. But we do afraid that no one will, will take these bids and I think that uh, a partnership between NGO and private investors, which we call social investors actually, can be a really good partnership with uh, um, making that come true. So uh, first, why, why did we decide uh, uh, to go into this really complicated thing? because we're eventually NGO, they're doing some classic uh, social projects. Uh, so first of all, because unfortunately no one is doing it in Jerusalem. And second, because I really think that non-for-profit has a, a, a crucial role in promoting, promoting innovative solutions for, for challenges that we have in the society. And eventually this is something that we hope that uh, uh, the government will adopt and is actually uh, doing it by itself now, but but I think this cooperation is a really important thing. Um, now the huge thing that that we're bringing, I think, and this is together with the Liftag Foundation, is to develop this new thing that you've heard from the people who who spoke who spoke in this conference early in, the, in this morning, is to bring what we call social capital. Now, I was in the States last week meeting with a lot of uh, Jewish uh, real estate people in the state that, that they're saying the same thing and it was amazing. They say, we don't want to give grants to Israel anymore. There's, uh, um, the Israeli government is, is uh, uh, 63 years old and you have, you know, you're, you're stable enough to, uh, to promote to, to take all the welfare issues, but we do think that this kind of solution of how we can be not a classic philanthropist, but to bring what we call social capital is uh, something that Israel is really missing. If we can invest in long-term rental housing for 15 years and we can get a return, but really patient, um, we can uh, um, use our equity as a patient equity and to get a uh, very modest return on equity, we're speaking about something between one to two percent, and this is something that nobody will invest just out of a, a financial interest. It's something that they are really interested in doing. I spent two days with uh, the Jewish community in Detroit that has a lot of uh, real estate people, and they all say they think this is fascinating and this is something they, they really think they, they will uh, be interested in investing it met some pe people in New York, and I think um, this is again how we can really uh, uh, shake the market and bring new equity to Israel, which I hope that we'll be able to find some Israelis who will be able to, uh, uh, to invest in this kind of uh, affordable housing projects and to help everyone together with the government to create a, a new market. <laughs> we built a model. No, no problem. We we built a model uh, that we're going to do the pilot in Jerusalem. I hope in the next few months of how to use uh, social investments in uh, building a building of affordable rental housing for young families in Jerusalem. The, what we want to do is to do the first pilot. We have a, a, a property in the French Hill that we're still negotiating on that. But what we want to do is take a property that has a special zoning, uh, which is right now for rental for students as dorms, but we want to change it for a, a, um, like a general uh, uh, rental to use the social investments to uh, renovate it from uh, dorms to small apartments for young families and then to rent it for long-term rent for young families that can rent it for one year or for five years, whatever. 
but we, we will run it as a, as a, uh, like a tall building for rental housing as it's in the States. And the social investors will get the money back in, you know, in a term of something between 15 to 20 years. We are working to build a financial model uh, with uh, Deloitte and with our partners here. Thank you. Uh, I think that that's a great time to hear from Shalim because she's representing sort of the patient capital or the strange kind of money that we are not so much familiar with that is willing maybe to do such an investment. So I would like to hear from you, Shalim. What are your... Okay. We don't have very much time on this panel, but I do think it's important to know that there is a, spe a specific model and a pilot project that is being developed. It's the building in the French Hill that Ali Shava referred to with how many apartments? 58 apartments. From what, what we know from our research, it's one of the first built for rental um, buildings, apartment buildings in Israel, which was really foreign for us coming from the States where you have such a culture of rental. I mean, we have apartment buildings all over where it's all rental apartments. And, and coming here and really understanding that there's no policy in this area, that this type of housing, particularly for young professionals, doesn't exist is something that was shocking to us and something that we feel like. Um, we need to lead to implement in Israel, particularly at a time where we feel like there's a lot of political will um, on the part of the government after the social protests and other factors that the, that the government and that the state is looking for pilots for demonstrations that can be scaled up if they're done right. So I, I do want to just uh, really um, emphasize that there is a specific model that we're working on and we'd be happy to share it. So as I mentioned before, we feel like as a foundation, you can't be working in Jerusalem without looking at, um, at housing. You can't be looking at keeping the city young, pluralistic, diverse without looking at housing. And what we're looking at is how can we use, what, what are our opportunities to use both our payout, which is substantial because we are a spend down foundation, so we're spending way above the 5%. We're spending about 13 million a year total, about 3 million a year in Jerusalem. Um, but both the, the payout as well as our principal amount, as well as our capital to advance our goals, advance our social goals really aggressively. Our board looks at philanthropy as the risk capital of the social innovation world, as the patient capital of the social innovation world. And we feel like we have a responsibility. We feel like this is particularly relevant in Israel where we have a responsibility to be at the forefront of introducing new financial tools in this country and um, scaling up, providing the resources and making it very easy for projects to come to scale. Um, so our program related investments of which this would be the third, this that we that we are pursuing, um, they're all focused in Israel um, and they're all focused on um, building out pilots for the government to take to scale just as our as our regular philanthropy is. Although the area is growing um, in traction in the foundation world, this idea of using both your principal and your payout to achieve social change, and, and Elisheva mentioned a growing interest, it's still really new in the Jewish world. There is a 20% growth rate annually, in the states at least, of foundations that are um, making investments rather than grants, looking to be the patient risk capital of the community. And the number of foundations which are engaged in mission-related investing, which this is called, this area is called, has doubled over the last decade, more than doubled. It's still mainly the, the very large foundations, the Ford Foundation, the Heron Foundation is a real leader in this area, and a few others that are on the forefront and in the Jewish world um, were, were far behind. And certainly in the number of foundations that are pursuing mission-related, program-related investments in Israel, there are people in this room that probably know those numbers better than I, but I think I could probably count them on both hands or maybe even one hand. Um, so we, we have a lot of room to grow, a lot of opportunities. Housing is an area that we feel really lends itself particularly well to investment. So we are looking to recruit both both PO individual investors as well as foundation investors. Our foundation, the Leash Type Foundation, has committed to being an anchor investor in this rental housing pilot project, but our board has also been very clear that we want partners, we want other stakeholders, that although we probably could fund, maybe we could fund the whole thing, it wouldn't be sustainable, it wouldn't be healthy to fund the whole thing. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll just say one more thing, that it's important to us to be really selective in where we place our mission-related investing. Um, 
we, we had great experience with Rofa as a grantee. They have a strong connection to the market. They're very accountable. They're, they're um, outcome oriented. The results are incredible. Strong leadership, as you see. But we also um, identified a need, and I think we collaboratively identified a need, to bring in the, the technical expertise, the type of mentoring that IBN is, um, is, is, is offering, but also a focus on the infrastructure of Rua Fadashah to help it build its model. And Sir Ronald mentioned earlier about the, the lack of infrastructure grants from the foundation world. The, um, I always say operating isn't a dirty word, word and, it, and it's come to be in the, word of, in the world of philanthropy. Everything is so targeted. So we actually made a grant of $125,000 for Rua Fadashah a few months ago just to build out this model to make sure that they had the resources that they needed to bring in the right lawyers, the financial firms, to make sure that there were people on Elisheva's staff with that expertise to, build, to bring in the Milken Foundation, to be sure that we're all, sorry, Institute, excuse me. <laughs> My English isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, uh, to make sure that we were all working together on the same team to achieve a common good. And it's, and it's an important um, distinction that I just want to want to emphasize for the nonprofits. These program-related investments and mission-related investments are incredibly new, and they need a whole other set of expertise in order to effectively administer them and effectively run them. And this is something that, in our view at least, the philanthropy world, the social investor world, if that's the new term in vogue, needs to be at the forefront of helping provide them with the general funds um, in order to give them the, the flexibility to do so. So I think I'll leave it at that. And can the economics, can the economics work on non-conversion of uh, norms? Because those are very few, right? So they, does the economics work on own build-outs as well? Um, uh, because we are short in time, <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. And uh, we do have a last speaker, and the question was difficult to answer. So uh, I will uh, give uh, Aviv the final words and then. It's good, I cut my presentation to only 45 slides. So, uh, <laughs> you guys go with me. No, but, but I did spend some time in, uh, in my career in uh, France. And after that, I learned that the worst spot in the world you can put yourself is between people and their lunch. So I never want to be in this spot. But uh, anyway, I think, uh, um, I, I think what we're getting here, uh, really from the perspective of the entrepreneurs in the real estate uh, world, uh, I, I think this uh, project gives a good example of what the speakers at the beginning of the day were talking about. Uh, it, uh, first of all, we have, we have a, a problem that is difficult and presents a gap between the market forces, the economy, and the social needs. So that's clearly the case because of the 3.5 or 3.56% of yield um, in the rental market. That's why entrepreneurs in real estate are uh, staying away from it, from it. And they will keep doing it as long as they don't get the incentives um, to, uh, to play in this market. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, the incentives uh, start to come with some um, preliminary models with some trials um, to get this market more attractive to the real estate uh, companies and the institutional investors. At the same time, there are organizations like uh, New Spirit and other in the, in, the, in the market that are also providing their share in terms of making this market more attractive. Because if you think about it, the audience that you have and, and who you are uh, selling your project to or marketing your project to is also very important because if you know you have a full stream or, a, uh, or a, 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 an audience that is uh, captive in a way and is insured, then you know that your uh, occupancy rate will stay high, that will also reduce, uh, reduce the risk. And then on the financeability side, you are getting people like, uh, of course, banks we follow later, but foundations that provide you with uh, more patient capital, as was the, the turn point here, um, but, uh, but some uh, reduced um, constraints on your, uh, on your uh, returns, that increases the, um, the attractiveness of the project. So it's sort of a triangle that everybody is coming to the dance floor together. I think we are all very much in the forefront of uh, what's uh, happening here. This is a, a affordable housing is a term that has been uh, in, uh, in the world, but in Israel, definitely. Uh, Decades, it's not new to anybody, 
but it's a um, but the solution is not there. So everybody is trying to work what the solution can be, and it really requires all uh, parties to come together um, until there are some successes. And of course, Ariel talked about this uh, attempt in Granada that everybody is in this industry is watching very uh, carefully to see what's happening. So so far, um, a reasonable level of uh, demand, at least on, uh, on getting the bids and uh, applying, and it's, uh, everybody is sort of watching it, I'm sure you're losing some sleep over it, uh, uh, on, on, on what will happen, because previous attempts in this world were not successful, hopefully this will be uh, um, the first. And I think uh, for uh, IBM, and for me as a member of uh, IBM, to be part of this, uh, of this uh, project, that is really pioneering this uh, territory, is uh, very exciting, and I'm sure with all these combined efforts, we will get to some uh, innovative Thank you very much, I want to thank all our panelists. I think it was very interesting.